Saying it looks like a 16-bit game is surely the highest compliment you could pay anything on the NES. In fact, it's become a bit of a cliche, hasn't it? Something you're sure to hear in any rundown of the NES's best-looking games. And this is what I have in mind today. I'm going to be taking a look at those console-wrecking, cartridge-rattling blasters that could, maybe, pass for games on a more powerful system. And I'm not just going to talk the talk, I'm going to walk the walk too. I'm not just going to tell you what looks good, I'm going to explain how these games look a lot more 16-bit than they should. But before I do, this video is proudly sponsored by Opera GX, the world's first browser for gamers, loaded with features you won't find anywhere else. GX Control really lets you take charge of system resources, allowing you to dial in just how much you want to devote to your browsing experience. You can throttle the CPU, memory usage and bandwidth. Especially handy if you want to keep a bunch of tabs open without it eating into your frame rate or causing lag. And yes, it does seem to perform better than Chrome, particularly with RAM utilisation. GX Player allows you to log into Spotify, Apple Music and YouTube Music directly from the sidebar. I'm a Spotify user and let me tell you this is way more convenient than the standard desktop client. It also pauses if you start playing something else in another tab and automatically resumes when you're finished. Not only that, but it also has both Twitch and Discord integration built into that same sidebar. You can stay on top of your Discord chats and get notified when a streamer you follow goes live. It's got an incredibly unique look with a load of customization features, use custom themes, colours, wallpaper and a whole load of other stuff, even link it up with Razer Chroma gear. It's also got a free built-in VPN and ad blocker, and something I never knew I wanted till I tried it, adaptive background music. It's free to download, so give it a go with the link in the description. And why not install and leave me a comment with the hashtag InstalledGX. I've been using Opera for years anyway, and this gaming-focused version really does have a lot going for it, and I can honestly give it a hearty recommendation. With that out the way, let's begin with Batman Return of the Joker. Released in 1991, it's a textbook case of this looks too good for the NES. I've heard it said many times that it looks amazing and well, it definitely does look good. A colourful evocation of its cartoon source material that manages to be about as stylish and atmospheric as you could ever hope an NES game to be. Huge, fluidly animated characters leaping around in gorgeous backdrops crammed with detail. There's something special on every level. The NES driven to a thundering gallop the whole way through. It's got the chops in every field. The music, the graphics and, well, even the gameplay whilst we're about it. This is one of the system's standout titles. But what about it transcends its console generation? What can we say really looks 16-bit? One thing that really stands out are the large number of background scrolling effects used to give a sense of depth, all of which require some very advanced techniques to make them work. The shoot 'em up style sections are pretty nice examples of this. You can see the background split up into five separate sections, each one moving at a different rate to give that effect. But this isn't that impressive, is it? Yes, this kind of thing was common in 16-bit games, but it wasn't that rare even on the NES or the Master System for that matter. Heck, you can even see similar stuff on the ZX Spectrum. We're going to need something better than this. Well, how about this eye-catching effect used in the opening level for a bit of retro game shock and awe? This is a bit more advanced. We've got split scrolling like in the shooter sections with what looks like the clouds in the background moving behind the building in the foreground. Yes, this is more interesting, a much more unusual sight on a machine like this. One thing that was really reserved for 16-bit machines was multiple background layers. Systems like the Super NES and Mega Drive could have two or more backgrounds that could move independently of each other, allowing parts of the scene to move behind others, giving the classic parallax effect. 
You could even split those backgrounds up into strips, giving really eye-catching visuals like here in the iconic opening stage of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, it's not quite as fancy, but what we have here in Batman, seen again in dramatic style in level 7-1, still looks quite good. Surely though this is impossible on the NES, it only had one layer of background graphics. You can't do the same trick as you can with those 16-bit systems. So how's this done? Well let's do some reverse engineering, shall we, with the debugging features of the fantastic Messen emulator. Let's take a look first of all at the pattern table as the game is running. This is the area of ROM where the graphics are stored. And well, it looks like there's quite a lot of activity here. That is very telling. If you take a look at the pattern table of an old school game like Donkey Kong, say, you'll note that it remains static. Yes, here are all the graphics for the whole game. The first generation of NES games were limited to just 8 kilobytes of graphics and that was that. Batman though, like most later NES games, makes use of an enhancement chip, or as they tend to be known amongst NES hackers, a memory mapper. The functions of these were pretty varied, but in this particular case, it's allowing for a much larger amount of graphics data stored in banks to be used and swapped in and out as needed, and I think that's how this effect is achieved. The movement of the background is being created by having the cartridge jump between a load of different frames of animation for those background tiles. Well that's my hypothesis at least, let's test it out. My research on the NESDEV wiki tells me that to start changing the graphics bank being used, the CPU writes a value of less than 9 to the command register, or memory address 8000. There's more to it than that, but it's only the first part I need to look for to try this out. Using the emulator debugger, I can set up a breakpoint that will automatically stop the game when this happens, allowing me to jump right in and see the code. And here we are, this appears to be the bunny. Let's see what happens when we replace this with a NOP or no operation, just telling the CPU to do nothing. If I'm right, we should see a big change in the graphics. And yep, with the game running again, it looks like the background is now totally still, but the rest of the game is still going just fine. Well, near enough. By replacing that instruction, I've stopped the graphics bank switching from happening, stopping the background animation, and also it would seem stopping Batman from being displayed properly. His animation frames must be in another bank as well. But I think this helps explain what is going on. When you see it as a static background, it looks very much like a lot of other NES games with not much going on in the scenery. The memory mapper though is what adds movement by constantly changing it. For the graphics chip, this is just business as usual though, with what it's displaying being constantly swapped out from under its nose without it really having to do anything. This is a very processor efficient technique, it only takes a couple of operations per frame to make it happen, but it is very memory hungry, taking up a lot of cartridge space, probably why it's used so sparingly. Return of the Joker is a towering graphical achievement and one that everyone seems to remember. There's no mistaking it, it does look great. And yes, it does have a bit of extra help from some circuitry in the cartridge, but as I say, this was very much the standard in NES games by this point. And this particular mapper, the FME7, created by Sunsoft themselves, doesn't really do anything that loads of others didn't already. There's more I could talk about in this game if I could understand it, but let's keep this moving. A slightly more obscure game now, this doesn't seem to have much mind share these days, but it's worth a look, I think. From one American hero to another, released in 1991, it's G.I. Joe. Pork chop sandwiches aside, this is a game you could easily ignore. It doesn't sound particularly auspicious, does it? A licensed tie-in for a toy line, these things are never any good, surely? Well, this isn't bad, actually. Yes, the developer's pitch started out with, it's like Contra, but... But hey, it could be worse. It plays really well, looks pretty good, and generally rises above mediocrity in every respect. 
and that's all well and good, you may be saying, but why am I getting excited about this? It's not fooling anyone that it's 16-bit, is it? Well, G.I. Joe does quite a few subtle but very top-level tricks if you look closely. The developers went the extra mile here, adding some details that really make this game shine, things you don't usually see on the NES. This boss sequence from the first level is a definite step up from the usual fare. It has you face up against a jet plane by attempting to knock it out of the sky with grenades. And I'm no army plane attacking guy, but I don't think that's how this is supposed to work. Anyway, silly as this is, it does the whole boss fight thing, but with a bit more flair than most games on this platform. But this or any of the boss fights in this game is not really what I want to focus on. What I really want to look at is this elevator section from level 3. But why on earth would I want to do that? It doesn't look that good, does it? Well no, on the surface this might not seem that great, but trust me, this elevator is very clever. Now I've got to say that if this bit looked like this, well it wouldn't be that remarkable. Return of the Joker does this exact thing, pretty much a vertical auto-scroller going up, this time something that's easy to achieve on the NES. What's amazing here though is that the elevator appears to be overlaid on top of the rest of the graphics. You can see the wall moving below it and you can see the ratchet mechanism through the gears. It even casts a shadow. On a 16-bit platform, this would be easy to do, but on the NES, it really isn't. There's not an obvious way to have such a large object moving independently of the background. It doesn't have multiple layers with transparency like, say, the Super NES, and it doesn't have the ability to do it with sprites either. It just can't draw enough. So how is this done? Well, let's investigate once again using some emulator debugging features. First off, let's try isolating the sprites so we can see what role they play. And yes, it looks like the edges of the screen, the elevator ratchet and the brick wall are done with cleverly positioned sprites. That makes sense, sprites can appear behind the background as well as in front of it, and when we show just the background, we're left with an elevator with black edges. But still, this doesn't explain how it's laid over the screen. How are we going to solve this? Well, I think it's time to get out the Event Viewer. This is an absolutely amazing and very powerful feature of the Messen emulator that basically overlays information about what is happening internally in the console over the normal graphics. It can work at full speed, go frame by frame, or even drop down into super slow motion and show what is happening as each scan line or each horizontal row of pixels builds up the complete frame of animation. This yellow line indicates which scan line is currently being drawn, and you can see it moving down the screen as the image is being constructed. The dots that appear represent significant events occurring in the code, giving you a clear idea of what is happening and when. You can set it up to show a whole load of different things you might want to look at. Nothing particularly relevant to us happens in the first part of the frame. The stuff we want to look at starts down here. This yellow dot shows an interrupt request, a feature of the very widely used enhancement chip known as the MMC3 that this game has in the cart. This is basically a timer going off that alerts the CPU to stop what it's doing and jump into doing another task set to occur when it reaches a certain scan line. Here you can see it's just before the elevator is drawn, so it's a good bet that it's something to do with that. And yes, just to note, this event occurs in this grey border area, which represents the horizontal blanking interval, the short gap of time between one line appearing and the next that occurred with old school analog video. The next thing that pops up are these two purplish dots, probably something we need to look at. What's happening here? Well, it seems a message is being sent to the graphics chip, and if we jump into the text representation of this info, we can see what it is a bit better. Two PPU register writes with the hexadecimal values of 22 and 80 sent to the address register. 
Without getting too lost in the weeds, this tells the graphics chip, the PPU, to draw the graphics stored in the video memory starting at location 2280. And yes, if we look at location 2280, we will find the elevator. So that explains it. No matter what else is happening when this part of the screen is drawn, the system is set to stop doing what it's doing and draw this platform. But what about this shadow? I can't see that stored anywhere. How's that being done? Well, this next interrupt seems to be responsible, popping up here to tell the CPU it's time to send another message to the PPU, this time to turn the background graphics off entirely, just not draw them, giving us this dark band at the bottom. The process then happens in reverse. Whilst the graphics are still off, another message is sent, this time telling the PPU to go back to the part of the memory where the rest of the stage background is and carry on as normal. Then finally the graphics are turned back on and it's business as usual drawing a vertically scrolling level until the next frame where it all happens again. I'm not sure but I wonder if this shadow isn't purely for aesthetic reasons but maybe to hide some glitchiness that this technique causes. Let's see what happens if we hack that bit of code so it doesn't turn the shadow on. Yeah that doesn't look so good, another tiny mystery solved. Hats off to coder Shoji Takagi, you sneaky devil, that was a good trick. Yes alright, it's a small detail, but this elevator section required some clever use of the hardware for an effect that I don't think I've seen in any other NES game. Actually, I should apologise, because in a previous video I looked at a very similar effect in Operation C on the Game Boy and said the NES could never pull it off. Well, I was wrong, sorry about that. Why didn't other games seem to use this technique? Well, I get the impression that back then, these types of tricks were not that widely known, but also it's probably not all that useful except in limited circumstances, especially when you consider the glitching it causes. How do the enemy sprites disappear smoothly behind the elevator? That's probably the final question if you're looking closely. Well, I honestly don't know for sure. I think it's to do with sprite overflows, but I don't really know enough to explain. It. If you do know what's going on, please let me know in the comments. Time to move on, but before I go any further though, can I just remind you to prod that like button if you're feeling that way inclined, and hey, why not subscribe too? That would be fantastic. Okay, now a game that's developed a bit of a better name for itself than G.I. Joe, it's Crisis Force. Again from 1991, a vintage year for good looking NES games. This is one of those that always finds a reason to appear on those NES top 10 whatever years lists. It's a limit pushing Japanese only hidden gem amazing vertical shooter lost Konami classic. It ticks a lot of boxes, it looks spectacular and it plays like a dream. Why it never saw a Western release, I do not know. It's not like it would have required massive localization. It's never had any sort of re-release either. I think Konami, then as now, just enjoys being bloody awkward sometimes. There's no end of stuff to be impressed by here. I don't think we're too far away from stuff you might see on the old Mega Syphilis. There's so much happening on the screen, but for me, the obvious standout is the parallax scrolling. These effects appear in a few parts of the game, but this section in level 1 is just fabulous. That deep trench in a scene that's already scrolling both horizontally and vertically. It brings to mind the fantastic compile shooter Musha Aleste, which appeared on the Mega Drive in Japan the previous year. This effect does look very similar to the horizontal split scrolling you'll see in a game like Vice Project Doom here, and of course Batman that we've just seen, but actually it's much more difficult. In fact, it's impossible. Yes, the NES just can't split the screen up vertically like it can horizontally. 16-bit machines could do this, what was called column scrolling, but not the NES or any 8-bit machine as far as I know. So how's this being done? Well, it's not. This is all just a dream. Okay, okay, it's real, and there's a couple of ways that this could be achieved, but I'm going to guess that it works a bit like the Batman parallax, but the other way up. This uses a slightly different enhancement chip than Batman, but it's got a lot of similar functions. 
A quick look at the pattern table seems to confirm this. It looks like the graphics are being swapped in and out, and quite a lot of them too, but let's make sure. The event viewer might give us another clue. Those blue dots are commands sent to the mapper, but there is quite a lot of them. The text version of this same info might be more useful. According to what I've read, I need to look for addresses starting with C, D and E. And well, it looks like we've got a few down here. Let's pick the first one and jump to that point in the memory, E, B, D, 0. Well, this seems to be a part of a subroutine that does a lot of stuff I don't understand. Too much for me to easily mess with. Let's look for when another part of the code calls up this particular subroutine by searching the memory for references to the start of it at address E, B, B, B. And here we are. Looks like this is stuff that executes in the vertical blank, this grey area here. The short bit of time between each frame being drawn. A very sensible place to be doing stuff with graphics. Let's turn this jump to the subroutine into another do nothing nop and see what happens. Yep, that's it. The specifics are a bit different from Batman, obviously, and there seems to be more graphics being updated, but it amounts to the same thing, really. Looks like my theory was correct. That piece of code was doing just what I thought it did. The mapper chip in the cartridge is automatically flipping through a sequence of tiles stored in the ROM to make those vertical strips move and give that depth effect, which should be impossible. It's the same technique that's used when these effects appear in the later levels, and it's incredible just how good all these look. The platforms on this level give a real impression of multiple layers when of course there aren't. And these enemies that seem to move in and out of the trench in this level are a really nice touch. OK, OK, one last game before I call it a day, but before I do, just a brief word. If you would like to support me on Patreon, that would be fantastic. Follow the link below, it helps me out a great deal. So what is it? It has to be, doesn't it? Of course, Summer Carnival 92 Wrecker. Released in summer 1992, unsurprisingly, this now often revered, formerly hidden gem takes its place alongside Crisis Force as one of those amazing Japanese Famicom exclusives that everyone says you should check out. And yes, everyone is right for once, because this is a stunning game held back only by its bruising difficulty. Developed by Kid Corporation, the same guys that did G.I. Joe, a company that very quietly created a lot of the NES's most technically impressive games in its later years. This one might well be king of them all, though. Coded by none other than Shinobu Yagawa, who later went on to work on some legendary arcade shooters for Cave. This is a sort of proto-bullet hell game that's got an amazing pedigree and a lot of fans. There's so much about this game that seems well above what you'd usually expect on the NES. The incredible speed and masses of sprites on the screen has never been matched done with some very judicious use of the NES's limited sprite capabilities. There's also the soundtrack, a real departure from almost anything else on the NES, with an electro-techno style sound that's heavy on the samples. OK, other games did feature samples, but never quite like this. It's pretty grainy, but it really sounds more like something you'd find on an Amiga shooter rather than an NES one. But I think it's the graphical effects that we need to look at in more detail. From level 2 we have this sine wave ripple of the background, which I've got to say looks very pleasing. You might have seen this sort of thing before, but rarely mid-game running so smoothly, done with some clever horizontal scrolling manipulation. But Wrecker has an even more sophisticated effect in its arsenal, and here it is. This weird scaling and warping swirling thing. It is, I would say, unique on the NES. In fact, it reminds me of this section in Rendering Ranger on the Super NES. It's the apparent scaling part that is definitely the most impressive. It looks like the background is being stretched and squashed, and the NES really doesn't have that capability built in. The SNES, yes. The NES, no. Let's take a look at the background graphics in the memory. Well, it all looks very static, so what's happening? 
Well, there's two possibilities for how this works. Number one, it's some sort of Eastern deep magic that harnesses the spirits of the ancients in some sort of mystical digital incantation. Or option B, and this one is pretty unlikely really, maybe it does have a rational explanation and I just don't understand it very well. What I think is going on is that this effect is done by adding a vertical component to the horizontal ripple scrolling we just saw. It's not just moving the background image left and right, but also moving it up and down, skipping some bits so it's squashed and then redrawing it again so it looks elongated, like a chaotic concertina. That's how similar effects work on other machines, but the NES really should not be able to do this. So what is going on? Let's take a look at the event viewer once again and examine some dots in detail. Is this good content? Oh, absolutely it is. Anyway, this looks a bit like what we saw in G.I. Joe, but for each interrupt we now have four rights to the graphics chip instead of just two. These are altering both the horizontal position of the background being drawn and the vertical too, in blocks as the screen is created, giving the concertina effect, I think. I was able to stop the horizontal lefty-righty movement of the background so we can see just the vertical component on its own, which does make it a bit easier to see, and yes, bits of the background are being revealed and uncovered. This hack was more by luck than judgement though, it just confounds my understanding rather than making it any clearer. Whatever's going on, the NES is not supposed to be able to do this, I know that much. It seems like Koda Yagawa-san was using some undocumented features of the PPU. For some reason this effect only runs at 15 frames per second too. To save time maybe? Well that would be sensible but the code doesn't seem to be working like that. And well on top of that quite how those four rights to the PPU do what they do leaves me a bit befuddled. It's only the third that has a different value every time, based on what appears to be a lookup table here in the RAM. Yes, it's either the ancient beast magic of the East, or I've reached my limit. That retro game mechanics guy probably understands it, but I bloody well don't. It's all a bit above my pay grade. There's some stuff about similar techniques online, but nothing that quite matches up with this. In short, Wrecker is an amazing game that does amazing things and it's worth checking out, but well, an original Famicom cart is not going to be cheap. It did have a surprise release on the 3DS in 2013, but well, that might not be available for much longer, so get it while you can, if you can. I'm not a real shooting game aficionado, but this was not just a technical showpiece, but innovative in its game design too, notable in every respect. So yeah, I think this is it now, time to call it a do. Did I really do the job? Does any of this pass muster as 16-bit? And yeah, I know, I know, it's never quite going to be, but I hope you can see what I'm getting at. If you have any suggestions for future videos, do let me know on, well, any topic. But hey, if you can think of any more NES games with amazing effects, well, stick it in the comments below and maybe I'll have a look. Thank you once again to my generous patrons, your support is greatly appreciated as ever. Yes, look at this parade of majesty, thank you guys. And of course, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time folks.